My name is Eric Van Horn. I bought my first franchise in my 20s, and since then, I've owned six brands with 25 stores in eight states. I've also helped a thousand people find the right franchise for them. People like us who are not cut out for the nine to five and like to work smarter, not harder. How do we find the right franchise, buy it, grow it, sell it, and how do we do it in a way to own the business without it owning us? Those are the questions, and I'm on a mission to give you the answers. Welcome to Franchise Secrets. Hey, welcome to the Franchise Story, Franchise Secrets podcast with your host, Eric Van Horn. And today's guest is Bedros Koulian. And Bedros is somebody that I've been wanting to get on the podcast for a while. Um, he's the founder of Fit Body Bootcamp, which has about 800 locations. And he's uh, almost like the unfranchise or the, I don't know what the word is that he uses to describe his anti-franchise mentality in ways. But um, I want to dive into that. He's a master of masterminds, and so we're going to pull a lot of value out of him today. So, Bedros, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Eric. Absolutely. So, when I first heard that you were going to be the keynote speaker at this one conference that we both attended, I, um, I talked to the ladies in charge of the conference, and I said, you know, what do you know about Bedros? And they just said, oh, we don't know a lot about him. We haven't interacted with him, but everything that we know about him He's the real deal. He's so nice. He's a pleasure to work with. And then I went on to uh, watch you give your keynote, and then you stayed in the room. You interacted with everybody. You watched the other speakers. And then later that evening, I spent some time with Crystal, and she was telling me some real uh, uh, stories of like who you are. And in this world of fake entrepreneurs, I thought this is somebody that is not fake, and I'm sure. It has to do with, you know, you coming to the America, not yeah. speaking the language. So can you dive in and start from there and tell us a little bit about how you got here? Yeah. You know, and I think you make a good point. Like my authenticity and vulnerability comes from just speaking my story. And my story's kind of like a Cinderella man is how I see myself. And I call myself the immigrant edge and the American dream because in 1980, when I was six years old, my dad decides that we're going to escape communist soviet union so there's my mom my dad older brother who's 14 years older older sister who's 16 years older and then me at six years old and so we made the escape into italy from italy we came to the we went to the american consulate and said hey we're political refugees my dad's like hey i'm a former communist i don't want to be a communist and so i wanted to go to the united states well in the 80s there was a cold war happening right mm -hmm. between the u.s and the soviet union so they they were like hey if we can pump you for information since you know how the communist world works we'll let you come into the united states legally so they pumped my dad for information and of course uh my dad was more than happy to share this information because he truly believes my dad's like he was so far ahead of his time back then uh, my mom tells me that he would wear like Jordache jeans and, 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 and Ray, <laughs> Ray Bans and, and Adidas shoes in a communist country when like wow. American stuff shouldn't be in there. He'd find it on the black market and, you know, listen to Elvis and the Beach Boys, right? So, you know, the guy was born in a communist country, but clearly he's just supposed to be a capitalist mm -hmm. and, and someone who seeks freedom. So when we came out here to the United States, you know, all of a sudden you realize well, we're in a country of opportunity and freedom. If you don't understand the culture, don't speak the language, and you're broke, you're struggling. So mm -hmm. the struggle was real, man. And so when you ask about, you know, hey, the, you know, there's this world of like fake entrepreneurs and real entrepreneurs, I've had to eat out of dumpsters. Like my dad, the third day in this country, he found his second job, which was to pump gas. That gas station was inside uh, in a uh, kind of a, like a mall where there's a, there's a grocery store. And he somehow went behind the grocery store and he saw there's this dumpster and that they're throwing away food that had expired, but wasn't necessarily bad, hadn't gone bad yet. And so that night he brings me to the grocery store, behind the grocery store, and he lifts me up into the, he goes like, pull out the bread, pull out the lettuce. How about the eggs? How about Do you remember that? Like, yeah, you know, you're six years old, you remember all that stuff, right? Six, seven years old. And so when you're eating out of dumpsters, and then we were living in, in, in Section 8 housing, while I appreciate the government having Section 8 housing back in the 80s, like this was filthy housing. And so I got lice. At the age of eight, I got lice in one of the uh, apartments that we lived in. My mom and dad couldn't afford to buy lice treatment. So my mom had my dad siphon out gasoline from a parked car to wash my hair with gasoline to kill the lice. Wow. So when you've gone through being called a foreigner, go back to your own effing country, uh, you have to learn the language to learn to communicate the culture. 
you know, eating out of dumpsters. My dad would always walk around the house. We're running out of money before we run out of month. It triggers something in your head that not only am I going to make so much money that I never have to have worry about it, but I'm going to take care of my mom and dad, my brother and sister, and that's exactly what I do late now. So 34 years later, here we are. Um, my mom and dad are thriving. They're in Anaheim, California. They're in their 80s. They have a beautiful mm -hmm. home that's paid off. Uh, my driver drives them around. Um, my brother, my sister works for me from home. My brother takes care of my parents. Like it's, it's a fantastic thing to be able to take care of them. So I didn't have the luxury to be a fake mm -hmm. entrepreneur to go, I'm going to go lease or rent a Lamborghini and take a picture because I was too busy building an empire because I know how crappy it is to mm -hmm. eat out of dumpsters and have your hair washed with gasoline and be laughed at and bullied. And so I knew that money was going to be my solution. Um, that doesn't necessarily make me money hungry because now mm -hmm. we donate a lot of money to charities and causes we believe in. But money solves the problem of not having money. It's interesting money. I mean, you know, I talk to a lot of people and as we've uh, become more successful in business, your perspective of money changes. Yes. And, and what I found is this, it magnifies what's already in your heart. If you're a giver, you're going to give more. If you're a hoarder, you're probably going to hoard more. Yep. And I mean, and proof's in the pudding, right? After you've made money, people see how you really respond yeah, to money. Yeah, you know, that's a really good way to put it. It is an amplifier, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so when people go, well, you know, money leads to evil things. No, people with evil intentions who have money now have the access mm -hmm. to evil things. Yeah. Let's dive, dive into how Fit Body Bootcamp came to be. I know yeah. you had, you know, you, you were in the fitness industry and then there was some struggle um, and it's all in your book. I mean, you're, you're, I was, I listened to your book twice. I, in South Dakota, on the mountain bike, going on trails. So your voice has been all over ah, South Dakota. Awesome. Thank you. Um, but a fantastic story. So people should read that. But get us to the point where Fit Body Bootcamp was, I think it was a franchise or had just become a franchise from a licensed uh, yeah. business. And then there was struggle within that. So mm -hmm. I'd like to kind of hit that point. Yeah, yeah. So I was a struggling personal trainer and I had a, I had a mentor named Jim Franco who was a personal training client who taught me the ins and outs of business, of being an entrepreneur. So, cause I would always complain to him like, dude, I'm in this gym training you making $11 an hour. I wish I could own my own gym, right? And so he helped me become an entrepreneur and I opened five personal training studios throughout San Diego, California. In the late nineties, I sold those locations. And um, as the economy crashed in 2008, and in, in that time between selling those locations in 2008, the economic crash, I was coaching and consulting the fitness industry. So did you lose money at that? Was it like a successful exit or is that like a, a... It was a successful exit. And I was like, holy smokes, had it not been for Jim Franco, my mentor, mm. I would not have even had one, let alone five, mm. and be able to sell it. And I'll, I'll be very frank with you, and, and this is a great lesson for every franchisee watching this. The fact that my personal training business back then was one of the first to, to have recurring revenue because if you remember how personal training mm -hmm. was sold back then, you would buy one or three or five like sessions. A pack, like a class pack. Remember that? And then after that, I got to take off my personal trainer hat and go, hey, Eric, do, do you want to buy some more? You just ran out of sessions. And <laughs> it's always that awkward conversation. And most likely you're going to go, no, I'll try and do it on my own from mm -hmm. here. Well, Jim said, hey, look, why don't you charge me on a subscription basis? And I was so small minded back then. I'm like, Jim, you pay me $600 a month. No one could afford $600 a month. He goes, I could. Mm hmm. And I realized, wait a minute, all my other clients are wealthy just like him. And so what was bought when I sold my business, they bought my receivables because I had everybody on a 12-month mm -hmm. contract, mm -hmm. right? So like Jim Franco taught me so much about being an entrepreneur, which is why I also talk about him in my book, Man Up. But, you know, kind of rich dad, poor dad, right? Yeah. And uh, so in 2008, the economy crashes and I see that these one-on-one -on -one personal trainers are now having a hard time getting clients because everyone's losing money. And in the meantime, I'm seeing these outdoor boot camps and they're just rocking. They're charging like $150, $200 a month, very affordable mm -hmm. versus 600, 800 for one-on-one -on -one personal training. And I said, if we can just bring these outdoor boot camps indoors, we can put them throughout the entire country because it'll be weatherproof, heatproof, rainproof, snowproof. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did in 2010. By 2012, we realized, whoops, we should be operating as a franchise, not a licensing brand, right? So we made the pivot in January of 2012 to become a franchise, which was very painful. It was painful because I meant well as a licensor in saying, here you go, Eric, here's a five mile territory for you. And there's a five mile territory for Ed. The problem was by giving 
a protected territory, apparently I had crossed the line mm -hmm. into franchising, which I didn't know. And so the state of California said, hey, we're going to fine you a lot of money <laughs> and do a big audit on you. They're good at that. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> and so I was like, oh, crap. This is how I go out mm -hmm. of business. And back then, we had about 115, 120 French or licensees. And I said, look, I don't have a penny to give you guys. And if you audit me or you find me, then I'm just going to go bankrupt. And now these 115, 120 location owners have no support. Mm. What if I don't sell another location, become a franchise? fix my mistake, and then you let, and they said, you know what, that's fair. Was this you at this time just coming up with these solutions yourself, or did you have some, some people around you that were giving you some good advice, like a gym or somebody like that? In that moment, I didn't have, it's funny, it's like you learn how mentors can take you to a higher level of success, mm -hmm. but then at some point you go, oh, I got this all on my own. And so I didn't have mentors in that era. I was just being scrappy mm -hmm. and figuring it out. Ironically, once we became a franchise, we realized, wait a minute, with franchise, there's compliance, there's regulations. That's when we hired consultants again mm -hmm. to mentor us and help us time collapse mm -hmm. and understand franchising, not in three years, but in three months, right? And so that was a big thing. But man, the pain of franchising and then the, you know, I had a business partner at the time, the act of franchising, and I talk about it here, He's a great guy. No one has made me laugh as much as he has. But we had gotten to a point in our relationship as business partners, and a great, another, another great lesson for your viewers and listeners, we'd gotten to a place in our business where we didn't share the same vision, we had different work ethics, and our priorities were completely mm -hmm. misaligned. And so I was suffering with so much anxiety. Mm -hmm. I would hear his Corvette driving to the building, and I, I, I'd start getting shortness of breath. And that, to me, was an indicator that something's not right. So in the process of franchising, now I'm asking my business partner for a divorce, <laughs> right? Which makes it more, more painful. And I said, hey, you could leave or I could leave. Uh, you know, the, the, back then we had like five or six employees. Every one of them said, well, if he takes over, we're all We're quitting. gone. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of took it over by default. And uh, the rest was history. But man, was it a painful birth. And then everything just happened. Money just started rolling in right after you. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. I wouldn't <laughs> go that far. Then, then you learn that, okay, selling a franchise mm -hmm. is a whole different animal than yep. just selling a coaching program or uh, DVD resources mm -hmm. because you can't just go out and claim that, hey, because Matt Wilbur and Bryce Henson make a million dollars a year from their Fit Body Bootcamp locations that you're going to do the same. Yep. And so it's a whole different way of selling. It's the, you know, the cooling off period. Like, Look, dude, when I, when I do coaching and consulting and you go, hey, look, I need to hire you and join your mastermind, I go 50000 for the year and you write me a check, mm -hmm. welcome to the mastermind. There's no cooling off period. There's no, There's no waiting off. period. There's no FDD, <laughs> franchise disclosure document to read. There's no, my Uncle Lou, who was a law student, looked over the FDD and he found 26 things. He wants yep. the red line. Like, yep. So all those things you have to create objections mm -hmm. for and a process for and webinars and education system so that you can overcome those objections before the franchisee, prospective franchisee ever has that, the cold feet, mm -hmm. right? And then of course, then they're, hey, I'm ready to give you money. Great, yep. now wait 14 days. Yep. So that was a big learning curve for us and, and make no mistake about it, we lost a lot of prospective franchisees who would have been a great fit because we didn't have a great process. But now fast forward, you've gone through that. You learned how to sell franchises legally yeah. and, and how to do it and how to help people through the process. And how many locations do you have now? Yeah. So now we're, we're just, just over 800 or just under 800 locations because we have some in development that aren't open yet. And what's really neat is over the last four years, we've hit the Inc. 5000 list uh, every year and we keep improving on the list. Um, in fact, we were this far away from the Inc. 500 list this year. And then we hit Entrepreneur Magazine's 500 fastest growing franchises two years in the last two years. And uh, it's so neat to think that here I am, no college education, a foreigner to this country. And all I had to do was one, not quit, mm -hmm. two, try and problem solve, three, rely on mentors and, you know, by their speed, by their time, they're coaching their, you know, success leaves clues. Mm -hmm. And dude, now we're one of the fastest growing brands out there. And I'm just befuddled by it, but I'm so grateful for it. Like, how does, it, how does somebody do that? Is it all in the mind and they'd see opportunity? You know, because there's a lot of people that come from this country. They're bo born poor. They're immigrants. They, they, life has not treated them well. They weren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Like, what advice would you give to somebody out there 
Maybe they're, they're young in their, in, in their childhood right now, or maybe they're in their 20s or 30s and they're thinking, you know, somebody owes me something, but inside they, they know that they're made for more than what they're doing now. Like, mm. what would you say to that person? Be relentless, be obsessed, become a control freak. Like, I'm an absolute control freak. My phone will not ring during this interview. In fact, I can pull my phone out right now and there's going to be zero text messages on there simply because I've blocked all texting right now because I don't need a distraction. And so I'm an absolute control freak of my time. Joan there oversees my schedule to the point where if I'm in a terminal about to board an airport, an, an airplane, I, she assigns me homework on my Google Calendar so that I can pull up the dock and work on the plane. My schedule, I, I'm in complete control of my schedule, my health, my mindset, the people that I surround myself with. I always jokingly say my wife. I, <laughs> and people go, well, what do you mean you're in control of your wife? Well, I send her loving little text messages and I make <laughs> videos and I send it to her because I realize I'm very obsessed type of person, very intense. And when I lock on on Fit Body Bootcamp, I can absolutely forget about my wife. And that's happened. And so now I've gotten better at sending her love notes, et cetera. And guess what? That controls her in such a great <laughs> way because, dude, every time I go home, I've got the most loving, most awesome wife, right? And so as it turns out, we have a lot more control over life than we realize. But control freak has gotten such a negative connotation. Look at yourself as a control king or a control queen, right? And that's how I look at myself. I, I've got 183 numbers blocked who can't call me. Some of them family, <laughs> simply because I don't want any negativity to come into my life. Mm -hmm. Like I control every aspect because life is dynamic. Look, I'm going to catch a cold. I'm going to get into a car accident. Mm -hmm. I am going to die one day. I can't control those things. But the things I can control, I'm relentlessly and obsessively controlling them. And that stacks the outcome of success dramatically in my favor. So somebody that, that's out there and they don't have the mentors that you've had, you haven't always had the mentors in your life. You haven't always had the social media influence that, influencers that you're friends with today. Sure. Like, how, what would you say to somebody? How would somebody go about getting mentored, finding um, somebody like that that can speak in their lives? The gyms. Yeah, that's a really good question. So my first exposure to a mentor, and I didn't know that he was mentoring me mm -hmm. and he didn't say, hey kid, I'm mentoring you. It was just, I realized, you know, years later after the fact, like, oh wow, I was getting, I was getting mentored by this guy in between sets of training him. You know, I was getting mentored and we'd go get coffee every now and again. But here's, here's some, I got mentored by Henry Ford. Now think about this, Henry Ford's dead and he was dead before I was even born or, or at least maybe not, but <laughs> he certainly wasn't around to mentor me. But I read enough books mm -hmm. to learn how he operated. And there was a story about him in uh, Think and Grow Rich mm -hmm. where Henry Ford is on trial and the attorneys are trying to erode his credibility. And they said, hey, you're not an engineer. How did you make the assembly line? You're not an accountant. Mm -hmm. how, how are you promising all these people that you're going to be the first person to pay a minimum wage, right? Like he was the first business to pay a minimum wage. Um, you're certainly not a car mechanic. You're certainly not an engineer. You're, you're not none of these things. And he goes, young man. I may not be any of those things, and I may not have a college education, but I've got this box on my desk, and on, those box, on that box are buttons, and when I press a button, I can summon the accountant, I can summon the engineer, I can summon the architect, I can summon whoever I need to get the knowledge. And I realized, as I was reading that, he's mentoring me, and he's really saying, surround yourself with mm -hmm. people who can fill in the gaps that you can't fill. Mm -hmm. As I started to do that, I realized, so, so I, I share this with you that Mentoring, hey, in a best case scenario, I would go hire you and you would mentor me. Mm -hmm. But if I can't afford you, can I afford to buy your book? Mm -hmm. Can I afford to follow you on social media, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram? Maybe that's where I'm getting mentored. Can I afford to come to an event that you're speaking at? And over time, if I take action on the stuff that I gather, mm -hmm. I'll accumulate enough money to ultimately hire you as a mentor to work one-on-one. -on -one. So I think in any franchise organization, uh, one of the secret weapons is the franchisee base themselves. It's the secret weapon to the franchisor and the fellow franchisees, because yes. the franchisor learns a ton from their bottom and top performers. Uh, but in my experience being a top performer in a lot of different brands, we all kind of come together and we all are doing things to make the brand better and to make our businesses better. Mm -hmm. and I know that you, um, you've kind of, uh, put things in place at Fit Body Bootcamp, like a mastermind to facilitate that. Can you yeah. take us into that and your mindset around it to why you did that? Absolutely. So again, realizing how valuable mentorship was for me and 
So I think about this, like, well, if I owned a subway, and I'm sure they've got, you know, systems and manuals and processes and all this stuff in place, but if I really wanted to learn from the guy up top or his leadership team, if I wanted to meet with them three times a year, do I have that ability? No, I don't. Why wouldn't Subway offer me the opportunity if I want to be a top performer and a multi-location owner to be able to learn from the guy or gal up top? And so I knew how valuable mentorship was in my life, how a time collapsed success for me. And so I said, well, guys, look, here's everything you get with Fit Body Bootcamp and all the stuff that we do for you and all the stuff we empower you to do for yourself and the PR company and the ad company, et cetera. But also, if you want to tap into the way I think, the way I process through problems, the, the way I run my leadership team, you're welcome to come out three times a year, every 100 days for a two-day mastermind where we sit in a group, and there's an, but there is an additional fee, but I promise you that the $1,000 additional fee that you're going to pay per month, if you take action on, will 10, 15, 20x that investment. And so, you know, we've got a mastermind now, nearly 100, 100 of our franchisees are in it, pay an additional fee for it, and it's no surprise that they're the top performers, <laughs> right? Because we time collapse, time collapse, time collapse. That's, that's exactly it. I'm part of uh, different masterminds and the, the networking that you get in there. And it's all about collapsing timeframes and just getting introduced to people. Yeah. I mean, that can help you oh, collapse those huge, timeframes. Huge, huge. I mean, think about this. They say your, your net worth is your network. And I used to go like, ah, oh, that's kind of cheesy until I realized, oh, wow, the people that I hang out now, I'm 44 years old. I'm in better shape than I was at 34. I'm going to be very honest with you. And that's because at 34, I hung out with people who I went to high school with and they lived by the, my best days are behind me. So, mm -hmm. you know, pot belly and dad bodies, et cetera. And so I was like, oh, well, birds of a feather. I guess it's okay mm -hmm. to give myself permission to have a pot belly. It's okay to be a little sloppy. And it wasn't okay. It wasn't okay. I should have stuck to my relentless, intense ways. Instead, I upgraded my network. Mm -hmm. And now when I'm hanging around with Mike O'Hearn, who's 50 years old and shredded, you know, this bodybuilder, uh, Ed Milet, who's pushing 50. I hope it doesn't hear, hear that. <laughs> he's 48. Um, <laughs> but he's like jacked and in great shape. And Andy, for some, like all these people who are entrepreneurs, who should be too busy to stay in mm -hmm. shape, who are older than me. And I realized, you know what? I got to level up, man. And so, yeah, your network absolutely impacts your net worth, your mindset, your physiology, all of it. So I wanted to, from a personal standpoint, talk to you about like Ed Milet and Andy, because you haven't been friends with those guys forever. No, no, just the last couple of years. So, I mean, was that relationships that you pursued and they became friendships or is that just like random encounters that, that a relationship started? A good question. I wouldn't necessarily call it a random encounter, but I put myself, I always say this, if you want to get hit by a bus, Go stand on the road. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. If you're sitting in your living room, it's unlikely you're going to get hit by a bus. So if I want to align myself and learn from and be friends with the Ed Milet, the Andy Frisilla, the whoever, you name, you name it, Lewis House, uh, Sean Stevenson, people I look up to and I've learned mm -hmm. from their books, et cetera, maybe I need to go stand on the road if they are the bus on their road, right? And so the way I did that is I started to, as my social media as I got onto Instagram a few years ago, I really started to reshare some of their best content. I gave them appreciation and gratitude. I left comments. And when I saw that Andy Frisilla had written a children's book, ironically, he's got a foul mouth like I do, but <laughs> he had written a children's book called Otis and Charlie Play to Win. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, this teaches kids how to be like winners and get competitive. No more just like everyone gets a participation ribbon. <laughs> so I went to the principal of my kid's private school and I said, hey, Miss Wend, how many kids do we have here? She goes, 250. I go, five by 250 copies of this kid's book. Here's one. Uh, would you share it? She goes, yeah, absolutely. I go, because we, we can raise like entrepreneurs here, right? And I just got all charged up about it. So I just went to Amazon and, you know, we ordered 250 copies. And so we stacked up those books in front of our Fit Body Bootcamp sign, and we just took a picture of me with my arms crossed. <laughs> and then I posted that on Instagram, and I tagged Andy Frisilla, and I said, thank God he wrote this book. I'm going to help so many students, 250 students in Chino Hills, young kids who are pliable, mm. become competitive, you know, winning, win-minded individuals. Um, I'm going to donate these to my, my kid's school. Within 30 minutes, he was in my, in, in my private message or direct message saying, dude, who are you? Thanks for doing that. How can I help you? Hmm. And I always show up with the giving hand. Mm -hmm. I'm never the guy. So, you know, how do you build a relationship? You don't just, you know, I get a message probably every hour 
hey, Beto, so I have 15 minutes, 15 minutes to spare. <laughs> no, I don't. If I have 15 minutes to spare, I'm going <clears> to <throat> sell one more franchise. I'm going to help one more mm -hmm. coaching client. I'm going to do one more interview, mm -hmm. right? But people don't realize how managed my time is. Instead, if they were friends, if a friend said you have 15 minutes to spare, I will find mm -hmm. the time if I have to wake up 15 minutes early or mm -hmm. go to sleep 15 minutes late to spend time with you. And so if I know that it's friends making money with friends and friends help each other make money, mm -hmm. why not befriend you? Come with the giving hand yep. and so much value until you go, you know what? You're, you're a good guy. And be genuine about it. That's it. That's it. It actually, actually feels good too. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I, jumping off of the kids part of that, I think I heard you the other day mention something about your kids, college, entrepreneurship. Yeah. Do you have any opinions on that? <laughs> Oh, I do have an opinion. I did a whole Empire podcast show about it, and it's quickly becoming one of our popular ones. I am anti-college, unless you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, an architect, some specialized degree. Because we want them to learn. We want <laughs> them to guys. learn. Like, I want you to practice on a cadaver yeah. before you ever touch me, yes. right? On the flip side, someone who's going to school to become a communications or marketing, mm -hmm. or MBA, what is it, a master's in business administration, mm -hmm. you're learning old archaic information that is not useful. Mm -hmm. You probably want to come and work for me for free and get an internship here, or at Google, or at Facebook, or at Andy's company, Ed's company, mm -hmm. and learn. Someone who's learning programming, software programming, they're mm -hmm. learning uh, mm -hmm. C++ in college, which now like it's the highest level of Java and this, uh, mm -hmm. right, right? So like, come and sit next to my coders, add value to my company, or Hey, let me pay you minimum wage to do something else while you learn via osmosis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I tell my kids, like, look, you guys are going to work in a service industry, like specifically food service, because I want you to deal with hungry, angry people, because you're going to learn how to problem solve and soothe people. Like, that's very important. Number two, I want you to learn to sell. So you're going to work at a Nordstrom's or a car dealership or something, because I want you to be able to persuade and influence mm -hmm. and sell. And if you can communicate and serve hungry, angry people, and soothe them, make them happy, make them your friends. And if you can sell something to someone, you're pretty much set to go for life. I love it. I was at, uh, had breakfast this morning at the Ritz Carlton with my wife and the people directly behind us ordered two different omelets and they came out opposite. And so they weren't happy. But by the end, uh, when we were getting ready to leave, I heard them just saying, oh, thank you so much for taking care of this and, and turn this situation around. And so learn customer service with oh, the right yeah. companies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, when I worked at, I used to work at Disneyland. I worked there for six years and I was a bus boy and then became a fry cook and dinner cook, et cetera. That's but, why you want your kids to do Right? <laughs> You've seen it. I interact. And now it, it's a whole new level at Disneyland, by the way, because now they're hungry and angry and they're in a hurry to eat and get to the next ride oh, or yeah. see the parade. And so you're having, they're yelling at you like, wipe the table faster, young man. It's like, all right, I'm going as fast as I can. But that taught me that I've got more to give. I can go mm -hmm. faster. I can, I, can, I can do two more tables before I take my bus tub back. I can communicate to them and say, yes, ma'am, I'm on top of it. Just give me three more minutes. Now she knows three more minutes. Now I just got to do it, right? I didn't know how to communicate. So I learned so much through working at Disneyland in the restaurant that I worked in, Carnation Cafe. I was like, I knew that my kids need to deal with hungry, angry people, and they need to sell something. And you know, if you're going to go to college, get that specialized degree, like a doctor, mm -hmm. lawyer, accountant, whatever we talked about. Otherwise, you're spending or wasting four years and going into massive debt mm -hmm. for no reason. I remember um, in college, I waited tables at Perkins Family Restaurant. Huh. And I was horrible. Like, yeah, I was not the best server. Food was always coming out late, but I always got some of the best tips because I could interact with, with the customers and they would always be happy and smiling. Not always, you know, but... You know, you learn so much doing some of these jobs that um, are everyday jobs for everybody. And then it just makes you appreciate too. Like, I don't have to do that anymore, but I'm always going to be a good tipper because I know what I right? have to deal with. Yeah. That's funny. Everyone who's ever worked in a restaurant industry, like I'm a great tipper too. When I first met my wife, she's like, why are you leaving all that money? I'm like, trust me. The bus <laughs> boys got a piece of that and yep. they're, they're the unsung heroes. And yeah. Well, speaking of uh, dinner, let's go into date night. One of the things, I don't know if it was just a rumor floating around the conference or not, but Be they said Bedros could only speak at this one, <laughs> this one like sliver of time yeah. this week. And I said, well, why? Well, he says date night is super important. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, and I'm here with you. I brought my wife with me yep. um, so we could have, you know, three days of some fun here in California. But talk to me about date night. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. It is holy for me. I mean, look, look at this. Like your wife is obviously the foundation of your, do you have kids? Three girls. Right. So you have three girls and you've got your wife and they're the foundation of your life. Like they, they're your reason why. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it's very easy for entrepreneurs to start neglecting our foundation for the sake of business. And again, we can be relentless. We can be obsessed. And before you know it, we're neglecting. And I had fallen into that. And so I would, okay, honey, we'll go, to, we'll go on a date on Thursday. And then Thursday, oh, you know, a business meeting came up. We'll go Friday. Friday, oh, you know, I'm going to go do this and Saturday. And before you know it, what is the message I was sending to my wife? Mm -hmm. You're not as important or valuable as this person, that meeting, and this business, right? And soon, life wasn't good for me at home, mm -hmm. right? So when I say I can control things, how do I control my wife? How do I control my life? Very simple. Let's set a date night every Wednesday. And it doesn't matter if I'm Salt Lake City, which is where I was, mm -hmm. or wherever, like Wednesdays are date nights. There, there are some exceptions, obviously, but Wednesdays are date nights and that's that. When you can control it, like that's you controlling that because you can control if they have you speak Wednesday or Thursday. I'm speaking the date that... Yeah, exactly. It's like, hey, look, if, if, if I can speak Wednesday or Thursday, then I either want to speak Thursday end of the day so I can fly in Thursday morning, or in this case, I think it was a Wednesday that I spoke where I was mm -hmm. flying out to go, right. and, you know, I landed and then picked my wife up and date night it was because the show must go on. <laughs> yeah. How difficult is it to control your calendar like that? And how, was it a, was it a, a, a progression over a, a, a while? Like what, yeah. how, how do you that, do definitely that? Definitely a progression. You, you can't go from having a loose, undisciplined schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been there to being so regimented. Now, now my wife, who's my CFO, my, my wife, Jesse, Joan, and Jamie, there's four people that add to my schedule. And they've gotten so good, like a little Navy SEAL team, to make sure they maximize every minute where I go from this meeting to that meeting, this call to, you know, what batch process calls back to back, right? It's not a meeting and then the call and another meeting. It's we batch process meetings, batch process calls. I have a sit, a sit down with Joan there, who's, who's my, one of my VPs. And and she has her list of questions. It isn't just, so what should we talk about today? I sit down with Bryce, the other VP. He's got his list of questions. Go. And because of that, I'm able to achieve more in the mm -hmm. same 24 hours that everyone else has. But, dude, I, before Fit Body Bootcamp, I was like, man, my, my schedule's full as a consultant. Like, I don't have any more room. How am I going to do this? You'd be surprised with how much time you can waste if you're not busy. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm super busy, I realize I've got my schedule locked down. So it slowly incrementally grew to where mm -hmm. every minute counts. But yeah, it's hard to go from, hey, I'm unregimented to all of a sudden I've got this strict schedule. What's the first step for somebody that wants to have that lifestyle? Is it, is it start in the morning or the night before? Yes. <laughs> good question. You listen to the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good question. So it, it the first step is to have a morning routine and everybody's morning routine needs to start at the night before. And you have to do two things. One of those two things is make a promise and keep a promise. Mm -hmm. And the promise you're making to yourself is I'm going to set my alarm to wake up at 5 a.m. or whatever time it is, mm -hmm. right? And you better not hit that snooze button because if you hit the snooze button, you broke a promise to yourself. And really what you're doing is you're breaking the first promise to yourself, telling your subconscious mind that you're not trustworthy and credible and trustworthy and credible and people who are not trustworthy and credible do not have successful lives, mm -hmm. right? So you begin to self-sabotage all day long. That's, this is scientifically proven. And so one, it starts the night before because you're not gonna hit the snooze button, you're gonna set the alarm, make a promise to yourself and keep that promise and you build credibility and trust with yourself. And that gives you the confidence to go, you know what, I can try this next thing mm -hmm. and not fail. The other thing is do a brain dump. Most of us go to sleep with, oh my God, I got so much stuff to do mm -hmm. tomorrow morning. I just open up my notes. I list down the three to five things that are what I call my 5%. Mm -hmm. The 5% rule is there's 5% of the things that have to get done in this business that only I can do. Mm -hmm. Like Joan can't sit here and do this interview. This is in my 5%. Yep. Uh, speaking from stage is in my 5%. Doing a live cast is in my 5%. Writing a, a broadcast, a, the, an email broadcast, or putting up my social media, that's in my 5%. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I'm not writing payroll checks. I'm not doing... So I do the... I make a list of the three to five things I need to do the night before in order of priority on my iPhone. I've taken it from my brain, dumped it out onto my iPhone. I go to sleep. I wake up at 5.30 without hitting the snooze button, water, coffee, and this is where the morning routine comes in. 
literally water, coffee, protein shake, play with the dog. And by 6.37 a.m., I'm sitting on the couch, phone on silent, just like it is now, turned upside down and pushed away from me. Why? Because I'm human. <laughs> if it's here and some weird notification comes up. Oh, so easy. Or am I just, I'm curious what notification, mm -hmm. right? But if it's pushed away, upside down, away from me. So I set myself, again, control freak, set yourself up for success yeah. in the mornings because now I've got seven, eight, nine, three hours to work on the stuff that's in my 5%. So while my competitor is only doing one of the five things because he's disheveled, I'm like a laser-guided missile killing all five things by 9, 15, 9, 30, I'm in the gym. And I come here, I shower, and then I'm ready to start working with my team So what time do you come in to the office? 11, 11 a.m. So a lot of people would be like, wow, that's, you've, you haven't done, you're getting to work at 11? I don't look at it that way because I've, you know, I've, I've read the book, <laughs> right, I've looked at right, that, and there's right. a lot of things right. that are important to our yeah. life that we can can get done in the morning at 11. Yeah. But is that, was that ever a struggle for you thinking, what, what's my team going to think if I get in at 11? Good question. So you've got to be able to message to your team what's really happening, right? And so my team knows that I wake up at between 5 and 5.30. 5.30 is the latest. That's when the alarm goes off. And I even set little rules. Like I, one, one rule I learned from my friend Tom Billiou, the co-founder of uh, Quest Nutrition. Mm -hmm. He goes, Bedros, if I, if I open my eyes and it's within 15 minutes of my wake-up time, I'm just getting up. I'm like, dude, that's such a great idea. Because what happens? I open my eyes at 5.15. I'm like, oh, I got till 5.30. Try and go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. But now it's like that. You wake up groggy. I'm like, dude, I'm going to adopt that. So again, success leaves clues. Mm -hmm. The man has a billion dollar company. <laughs> I think I'm going to model that, right? And so to me, it's very important to model success. But going back to your question, um, I get more done on the couch between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. than I ever do in here by way of moving the needle. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm constantly the problem solving because at the end of the day, when you're the CEO, you can't turn to someone else and go, hey, mm -hmm. what do we do? Mm -hmm. So even the most highest ranking people turn to me and go, hey, B, what do we do? And I go, here's how you put out that problem. Here's what you're going to say to this person, et cetera. So over here, I'm problem solving. At home, during my quiet magic time, those three hours are spent on moving the money needle. So... Is that, do you ever have the moving the money needle times like in the gym or things like that when, you're, when your mind's not on business, but you're doing something else that is, that is not busy work? For me, it's I'm out mountain biking. And like, you know, a lot, you know, as I was listening to your book and I'm out mountain biking and I'm thinking, oh, I really want to learn this from Bader. So I want to talk to him about this on the podcast. Yeah. Do you find that? Absolutely. And do you know why that is, by the way, when you're mountain I biking? Then I'll, let me explain to you. There's something called bilateral stimulation. In the psychology world, they call it EMDR. EMDR was started by a psychologist who one day figured out as he's, he had a little wand and he would tap you on one knee and the other and the other. Tick tock. Think about a pendulum on it, mm -hmm. right? When there's bilateral stimulation, when you're running, when you're biking, when you're swimming, when you're lifting, doing something with rhythm, you tap into the left and right side of the brain. And that takes unprocessed information, like in, in, in psychocybernetics, Maxwell Maltz calls it the theater of the mind. It hmm. says you have a problem, put it in the theater of your mind that night. Say, okay, all right, mind, work on this while I sleep. Why sleep? Because you're also in those theta waves. So you get mm -hmm. the same theta waves that you would when you're on a bike pedaling away. Okay. You're now process using both sides of the brain to process through whatever thing that you want to process through. And so you, if you have your, your big aha moments or you're thinking of naming a product and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, I got it while I was on a hike or while I was, mm -hmm. I was biking, swimming, that's because if you're sitting at the boardroom with the notepad, yep. you go blank, right? <laughs> and so for me, yeah, I do a lot of like aha moments, right? Oh, okay, let me write that down in between mm -hmm. sets in the gym. But yeah, I, I do a lot of processing of stuff in the gym. I didn't know that's, I was like, where did these great ideas come <laughs> from, right? Why in the gym? Why when I'm out biking or running? And it's because of bilateral stimulation. Interesting. So I think my takeaway is I probably need to do more of that. Yes, sir. More, more fun, more mountain. Does it happen when you're out on the lake in boats? Probably not. <laughs> I haven't tried it, but maybe you should try it. I'll see. try it. I'll, yeah. I'll try it for a couple of years to, before I uh, report back. Um, so work-life balance. Like when you hear that, what do you think? Everyone kind of has an opinion on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No such thing. Look, everyone watching this is either an entrepreneur or wants to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. right? There is no work-life balance because everything's lopsided. Like right now you're working. Mm-hmm. And you balance that out by bringing your wife and going on a date the next three days, right? Here <laughs> in right. California. <laughs> That's it. It's a work-life mix. Mm -hmm. It's not a work-life balance. 
uh, here's the reality, man. If we sign the back of the check, we can clock out at five o'clock, shut this brain down, mm -hmm. and go balance out our family life. So do you think that's the difference between entrepreneurs and people that are clocking in nine to five? Do, do, do they see things as that work-life balance because it is balanced for them? Yeah. Clock in, clock out. But us entrepreneurs, we have You're to- You're not clocking out. No. You're always processing through problems, challenges, adversities, opportunities, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to have a work-life mix. So there's times that I'll have a speaking gig in New York and I'll be like, hey, Andrew, my son, why don't you come with me? He's 11 years mm -hmm. old. We've got a rule set. Again, going back to control. Uh, as long as he and Chloe, my daughter, are getting 3.8 or better in school, I'll pull them out. They'll go to New York with me. I'll speak. Then we'll spend two days doing the Empire State Building and, and, and uh, uh, eating some, some New York pizza, whatever, like we have this experience. Mm -hmm. And they're in the seminar learning from not only myself, but from my peers, mm -hmm. right? And so it's this experience of teaching my kids, and it's a work-life mix. Mm -hmm. And I don't, they don't ever feel like, Gee, my dad missed my fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. I might miss a weekend because I'm speaking at an event, but guess what? We're taking Tuesday, Wednesday off and we're going to Disneyland as a family, just like it's a weekend. Mm -hmm. and there's actually less people there. Mm -hmm. So we get to have more fun. So entrepreneurs, I've seen some of them get to the point where they achieve a level of success. That mix is more work than life with the family because they're always wanting to go to the next level of whatever. What is it for you that you were able to keep that mix the, the way that you wanted it to versus letting success achieve the mix that it wants us to get? Good question. So in addition to Fit Body Bootcamp, I own five other uh, businesses, companies, corporations. And what I learned very quickly is I'm full of great ideas. All entrepreneurs are. Like we need 10 more lifetimes, <laughs> right, to, to implement all of our ideas. You don't have that kind of lifetime. At best, you're gonna do your best to live to 100 years old, a functional body and sound mind. So if all you got is 100 years, but you got all these great ideas, what do you do? It's not the how do I do it, it's who can do it with me and for me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've learned to, so I started a supplement company, great, we got this guy from, Aaron, uh, from Scottsdale, Aaron, you're now our, our VP of supplements and he will uh, one day be the CEO of our supplement company. Uh, Bryce will one, take, one day take over the CEO as, as Fit Body Bootcamp and I will elevate to the board of directors. Uh, the software company that we have has a different CEO. And so because of this, I'm able to do, take all my ideas and implement them, but through other people. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you're trying to do it all yourself, it's time theft. You have mm -hmm. to steal from your health, your family, your wife, mm -hmm. somebody, somewhere to, to be able to get the thing done and you're not going to be able to steal. Time. So you're not in the business of time theft. You're in the business of speeding up time, collapsing time frames, yes. and getting things done. Um, Team members, we've talked a lot. You've, you've named names today of yeah. people that are on your team. You don't call them employees, you call them team members. Yes. Why? Employees clock in a little late, clock out a little early and do the bare minimum to maintain employment. That is not how you build an empire that's designed to make a massive mm -hmm. impact on this planet. That's my goal. Team members, on the other hand, know very clearly what winning looks like mm -hmm. and they play together to win. And so, if that was a definition, do you want employees or team members? Mm -hmm. Team members, right? All day long. And then you take your team members and you turn them into fighter jets <laughs> by teaching the same level of discipline. All of us have claws and fangs in us. We're all fiercely, mm -hmm. relentless, obsessed, etc. Problem is we get neutered as children and it's like, hey, don't, don't ask for what you want. Uh, you don't have to be that intense, etc. So I tell my team, no, go after what you want. Set high standards of expectations. Have attention to detail. Show up on time um, or early, right? Mm -hmm. And so they go, oh, you know what? Don't hit the snooze button. They go, it is okay to take control of my life. And so then the team members go into fighter jet mode. And then this is why we're able to you know, move the needle faster. Um, as we wrap up with one last question, like, I want to dive into your zone of genius. Like, sure. what do you, what do you, you, you talk a little bit about it. It's that 5%, right? The 5% of things that you do. Yeah. So I want to know, like, what is your zone of genius and, and how much of that zone of genius do you love to do? Like, is that, does that energize you? Is it 90% or 100%? Good question. So do you know who Dan Sullivan is? Yes. So Dan Sullivan talks about, uh, he says, he has three circles and he goes, circle A might be, the things that are within my zone of genius that just irritate me and frustrate me. Mm -hmm. In B, you would write uh, the things that are, I can tolerate. Mm -hmm. And in C, like things that just energize me and excite me. 
And he goes, why don't you write down what percentage of your day is spent on the things that irritate you and frustrate you, things that you tolerate, da, da, da. And so when I went through that exercise years ago, I was like, holy smokes, there's a lot of my zone of genius, but 80% of the things I don't like doing and it mm -hmm. frustrates me and it makes me a bad person mm -hmm. because I'm cranky. So today it's a little lopsided. It's like 80% of what I do is in my C box of things that energize me, excite mm -hmm. me. It's my zone of genius. I found typically that's, I still love coaching, which is why I love running the masterminds, mm -hmm. right? I love coaching. So I'm still a personal trainer, but instead of one-on-one, -on -one, now it's one on many, just mm -hmm. like my boot camps are, right? Where all of our franchisees I coach. I have coaching clients from different industries that I, that I coach and mentor. I love that. I love helping people get the aha moment, just like I got early on. And my other zone of genius is to live two to three years out where Fit Body Bootcamp is concerned. So I'm working on artificial intelligence up here about with Fit Body Bootcamp. Like two years ago, I was working on our supplement company that we launched earlier this year. So I'm always two to three years out. Where's Fit Body mm -hmm. Bootcamp two to three years from now? And I'm doing the, what I call, so there's practical thinking and there's possibility thinking, right? Practical thinking is, well, this is what's realistic right now with Fit Body Bootcamp. And that's the day-to-day -day work, mm -hmm. right? possibility thing like hey what's possible what's possible if i had someone who would be able to be the ceo of my supplement company is it possible to launch a supplement company in two years and make it a 10 million dollar a month product uh platform i think it is possible all right so let's reverse engineer that so i'm always living out in the future that's my zone of genius mm -hmm. and i'm always and, and, and coach people now do i have to deal with attorneys and stuff and ugly stuff in my life of course but it's a much smaller percentage have you always been that way i mean because you i mean you're you have a lot of success right now. And, and with Fit Body Bootcamp, your masterminds, just, I mean, so many things. But, you know, the Bedros of a number of years ago, you, you wouldn't be able to back it up like that. So, no, like, sir. No, no, no. I was, see, this, I was a crop duster of like the, yep. the worst kind, man. And I talk about that openly in my book. And that's why I was dealing with anxiety attack after anxiety attack, essential tremors. Um, and that's because I felt like, I had zero control over my life, mm -hmm. my franchisees, my business, my employees, my health. And when you don't feel like you have control, you start blaming mm -hmm. others and pointing fingers. And the easiest way to deal with the stress of all that stuff is I was drinking NyQuil every night, like a big shot of NyQuil, and then chasing it with a Vicodin to fall asleep because my mind would race mm -hmm. and anxiety would keep me awake. Well, now in the morning, I was so foggy headed and groggy that I would have to drink like extra coffee and then mix pre-workout and water, even, if I w even though I wasn't working out then, because I needed to boost my energy back up. So I share this with you because I realized very quickly that when you're disheveled and lacking discipline, you're going to deal with stress and overwhelm and frustration. Mm -hmm. If you decide to get disciplined and become a control freak and build a team around you and not just employees, you're still going to have entrepreneurial stress but there's good stress. Like there's, you know, you go home mm -hmm. and you're like, man, I am exhausted, honey, but we really moved the needle mm -hmm. today versus I'm exhausted and we did nothing to move the needle. I'll take the I'm exhausted, but we moved the needle. And so that's where I am today. And that's why I'm such a freak about my schedule, my lifestyle, my health, my business, all that stuff. Well, Bedros, it's been a lot of fun. And it, some takeaways are, I mean, take, I mean, everybody can take control. It's your mind. You Everybody out there can achieve this level of success if they, if they surround themselves around the right people, they have the right mindset, and they actually look at things as opportunities and not problems. They, they're solution-focused versus problem-focused. So I love what you're doing. Thanks for uh, coming on the show today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.